Welcome everyone, my name is Florian Schmidt, I'm an engineer at Nutanix, and together with my colleague Ivan Tetrevkov, I'll present Lessons Learned Building a Production Memory Overcommit Solution. And the title really already says what we set out to do. We wanted to create a self-adapting memory overcommit solution, which sounds easy, right? Well, obviously there are some pitfalls here. And we soon realized that we can't write everything from scratch, especially not our own memory management. So instead, we decided to leverage existing technology. And it turns out that that was probably a good choice because a lot of building blocks for such a solution already exist. Um, so we could use uh, the Linux memory management system, C groups for control, the Virdio balloon driver uh, inside guests, ProcFS for stats collection, and so on and so forth. And the only thing that was really missing was a central tool that tied all of these things together. And this talk is about design choices and challenges that we faced on the way. Now, when we talk about memory overcommit, there are two practical solutions that are in wide use for that, ballooning and hypervisor swap. Uh, with ballooning, you have a Virdio driver inside the guest that um, allocates memory and sits on it and then gives it back to the hypervisor for use by other VMs. Um, the advantage here is that the guest can choose which memory to give up and uh, the guest generally knows best. Um, this might also not cause swapping because it might choose to give back memory that is not even in use at the moment. The big disadvantage is that this requires guest cooperation. So if there's no balloon driver or the balloon driver is broken, uh, you're out of luck. And also state gets lost on reboots. So memory that was handed back might suddenly be used by the VM, again, breaching the contract, basically. Um, the other option is to use hypervisor swap, where you treat a VM basically like any other application. Um, you swap out parts of it when you need more memory, and you can control how much each one of those uses with C groups. The big advantage here is that no guest cooperation at all is required. And when we first set out uh, to build our solution, we thought, well, the balloon driver sounds nice, but if it's not really supported by, um, by every guest, we want something that is, you know, applicable everywhere. So let's just go with hypervisor swap. Of course, hypervisor swap also has some downsides, and the biggest downside is probably its performance, uh, especially when you are hit by a problem sometimes called double swapping. And let me explain to you what that means. Um, so here we have an example set up. We have some memory, uh, part of which of the host memory is used by the VM, and then we have swap at the host level and we have swap at the VM level. Now. If the host decides that the VM needs to give up memory, it can identify some idle memory and swap it out to the host swap. Um, shortly after, the VM might also realize that it is under memory pressure, search for some idle memory and decide to swap it out. Except now, to swap this same page out, it first needs to swap it in, just to swap it out again on VM swap. Even worse, if the VM is under memory pressure, chances are to even swap this memory in you first need to swap out some memory, to swap in some memory, to swap out some memory, and you can probably see where this is going. You create a lot of additional um, uh, I.O. and can easily end up uh, thrashing badly. And the most insidious part about this is that the better your memory management system works, or the closer the ones in the VM and the, guest, uh, and the host are, the more likely it is actually for this to happen because they will identify the same idle pages. So I think we have established that ballooning might not always be available or reliable, but hypervisor swap can have severe performance issues. So the solution here is pretty straightforward. We want to combine both to get the best of both worlds. And the guiding principle would be that you use ballooning where it's possible and you fall back to hypervisor swap where it's necessary. So simply, if you want to shrink a VM, you would first try to balloon out some memory and only then reduce the C group reservation of the VM. And conversely, if you grow a VM, you first grow the C group limit and then you balloon in the memory that is now available. Of course, as I said, if the balloon driver isn't available or just doesn't want to comply, then eventually you give up and you just use hard C group limits. 
Um, another problem that we saw is that um, when a VM starts swapping, um, then it needs memory and it needs memory fast because the performance is tanking. But if you used up all your memory, then to grow one VM, you first have to shrink other VMs before you can grow it. And shrinking a VM can be a quite slow operation. Um, IO is of course slow, but also the balloon API is not the fastest in the world. So um, a solution here is to keep some buffer memory uh, at all times that is not in use by any VM. And then when a VM needs memory, we can quickly grow into that buffer. And then asynchronously after the fact, we reclaim memory from other VMs to replenish this buffer. Of course, there's a trade-off here between uh, reaction speed, so we react quicker, but we reduce the overall memory efficiency because now there's some memory around that we don't permanently assign to any VM. But this seemed to work for us pretty well to increase the reaction speed. Now I talked a lot about growing and shrinking VMs, but we need to make a decisions which VMs to grow and shrink, and for that we need some stats to make these decisions. And if we have a balloon driver, then we're actually in a quite lucky position because the balloon driver is not only a control interface, it also collects information um, inside the VM and makes it available to the host. And so, for example, we can get information about how much um, swap in and swap out has happened at a VM level, uh, which is important because from the outside we can only see I.O. and we can't know whether that is swap I.O. or other I.O. Um, we also get information about how much memory might be reclaimable from the VM. There's a stat called usable that is uh, provided by the balloon driver, which is defined as the amount of memory that a VM can give up before it starts swapping. And that is exactly what we want to know uh, for our uh, scenarios. Um, if we don't have balloon driver information, or maybe in addition to it, we can also have some stats available at hypervisor level. So um, swap-ins from host uh, level swap, we can identify because the number of major faults of the chemo process, which owns the VM memory, uh, will increase. Conversely, there's not really any single stat that allows you to identify host swap out, which might be quite valuable. You can try to come up with some rough heuristics to estimate that, but it's, it's tricky. And um, if you're talking about reclaimable memory again, then what you can do is you can do some working set size estimation, but more on that later in this talk. So now we have ways to grow and shrink VMs and we have stats. So now comes the point where we tie these together into uh, an algorithm. And at a basic level, uh, our algorithm works like this. We m categorize VMs either as needy which means that there's some swapping going on, like some not insignificant amount of swapping. And then we say the VM needs more memory. Or a VM can be greedy, that is, it's not swapping, but it has unused memory to give up. Now, one problem is for these greedy VMs, we saw that we have ideas of how much memory is reclaimable. But conversely, we can't know how much memory a needy VM needs to stop swapping and being needy. It could be a little, it could be a lot, we can't know. So the best that we can do is we can give it some memory, then check whether that improved the situation, and if not, give it some more memory again. So the algorithm goes like this. You look at the VMs that are running on the system and you order them by their neediness. So you can see here, for example, the red VM has a lot of memory pressure, a lot of swap happening. The green VM is not swapping as much, but also. So if you order them, you have the red, green, and then the, the two VMs that are not showing any neediness at the moment. And then you hand out based on that list position. So the red VM gets more memory than the green VM, and the blue and yellow VM uh, give up some memory accordingly. And um, then you come up with this plan and grow and shrink the VMs accordingly, and then you rinse and repeat that uh, over and over again. Of course, there are a lot of special corner cases and, and situations that you have to think about, but uh, I will not go into detail in this talk and let's just suffice it to say that this is the basic idea of this algorithm. Okay, I will now hand over to my colleague Ivan for the rest of the talk.
Hello, and let's talk a little more about the metrics and stats we collect about the running VMs. As Florian said, we have quite a few available at the host level, such as uh, ProcFS files, and we also use the Virtio Balloon driver stats reported about the ingest situation. This is useful, however, the Virtio Balloon uh, Virtio drivers are not always installed uh, in guests, or they may be malfunctioning for some reason. In this case, we'll be looking for more stats at the host level to get more insights about the in-guest workload and the working set size is one of them. It's fairly, uh, it's fairly accurate and it's reliable, always there, we can trust it. Practically, high estimate means that VM needs memory. There are some corner cases, but they are other one-off situations that we handle. The metric is based on the page tracker available in the Linux kernel. As many of you know, it's a bitmap interface indexed by the page frame number PFN within the host address space. Um, we could, of course, we could track all the pages available uh, within the host and get the uh, working exercise estimate for the VMs, but this is not practically achievable at scale because there are hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes of memory. So we need to do some sampling and we've been considering two approaches. The first one is to sample the guest address space with the page map interface. So you could uh, get the sample set within the guest address space, map it to the host PFNs and give it to the IPT. Uh, this, this is possible, but this comes with a computational overhead. More guest address spaces you have, more CPU cycles you need to burn to filter out the PFNs. And things worsen with the memory of commit because you have even more guests within the same uh, address space of the host. The second one is um, getting the PFN sample within the host address space and filtering it out, assign it to the running VMs with the KPHC group interface. It's another binary file that says this PFN is being accounted by this uh, C group uh, partition within the memory controller. And this is possible in our case because we put each guest, each VM into its own um, C group partition. The computational overhead is still there, but it's constant and it doesn't depend on the uh, number of running guests. So we chose this approach. We create a sample set of uniformly distributed PFNs within the host address space. Then we map it to the running VMs with the inode um, KPHC group interface. Then we give it to the IPT and get the raw report. This report is inherently noisy because we use the random sample set, random distribution, and therefore we need to do some post-processing. We use the moving coverage to get the fairly stable and uh, settled metric. And this metric is used along with others to make decisions about whether VM needs memory or could give it away. Now let's talk about the issues related to live migration. Firstly, I want to highlight that we use shared memory. Uh, this is because uh, the storage data path for the running guests is handled by a separate process, and this process handles the in-house developed storage data fabric uh, in Nutanix, and it shares memory with Kimu. This is important because shared memory handling differs from private memory in the Linux kernel, and more you dive into the source code within the kernel, more you realize the differences. Now let's consider an example. We have a guest, and let's say 75% of its memory is present in the host address space and 25% not mapped, either because it's ballooned away or never accessed. This is possible for Linux guests. And for simplicity, let's say the host swap is not used for this case. Uh, the C group, the, um, the C group limit is in place and it's nicely aligned with the uh, currently present memory in the, in the host address space. Now let's migrate it uh, with Kimu from source to destination. Kimu must read the entire address space of the guest at least once and transfer the, either the content or the control message that the page is zero to the destination. When it happens, it also accesses the pages that are not mapped and as a result of the check whether the page is zero or not, uh, the kernel handles this uh, uh, minor page fault, allocates a new zero page, gives it to the Kimu, and then Kimu uh, deals with it. When it happens, uh, the LRU policy uh, kicks in and then it replaces the inactive pages present in memory with the zero pages just allocated uh, for the Kimu zero check. And as a result, we have few problems. At the end of the iteration, we have unnecessarily allocated zero pages. We didn't want them in first place. 
we also had some swap I.O. happening that we could have avoided altogether. And we also mangled the host, uh, sorry, not the host, the VM's working set. Because if, for example, the guest wants to retrieve the uh, pages from the host swap, then this would be an even further performance drag during the live migration. This could be avoid avoided altogether, and there is the way to work it around. There is a recently, fairly recently introduced uh, M advice called hint to the M advice system call. It, it comes with the Linux kernel 5.4. Essentially, it allows the user space to say, hey, kernel, I have this uh, address range. I don't use it, it's called. Whenever memory pressure occurs, please take it away. And this is what we're using in the Kimu. Uh, we go to the is zero page check. Uh, and before actually performing the check, we consult with the page map interface, uh, check if, it's, if the page is present or not. If it's not present and if it's zero, then we could reliably conclude that, more or less reliably conclude that it's not, uh, it was allocated as a result of the zero page check. So we definitely want to get rid of it. We mark it with the mAdvice code and the kernel, whenever the pressure occurs, the kernel simply discards it because it's a clean zero page. So this is how we work it around. Uh, the second problem uh, related to this configuration is that, let's say we have the guests with a similar config, um, but it uses the host swap before performing the live migration. In this case, whenever the Kimu accesses the swapped out pages, it replaces some cold memory some cold pages present in memory with even colder from the host swap. And in this case, it replaces, it mangles the working set size in a similar way to the previous configuration. Um, from the guest point of view, it looks um, uh, it looks somewhat incorrect because it has some working set and now some part of it is being replaced, some cold memory is being replaced with even colder memory, which is uh, not, not what we want. And in the end, we also could avoid the swap out of the cold pages that are currently present in memory for the guests. And there are ways to improve it. Obviously, we also mangle the working set of the guests similarly. A workaround, a solution to this problem is using the page out hint to the MNY system call. It's similar to the previous one. It comes with the 5.4 kernel. And it, it allows us to say, hey, kernel, I don't want these pages. Please page them out. And since we have them already paged out and the entries present in the host swap, uh, kernel simply discards them. So it saves the time. The approach is fairly similar. We go to this E0 page check. We check the page transferred over the destination. It causes the swap in of the page, but then we call the page out and avoid the page uh, swap out of the pages. And this gives us the performance improvement. A problem with the shared memory is that the page map interface does not report the PM swap bit for the pages if they shared memory. This is, this is not a problem for the private memory. So from the user space point of view, whenever you have the shared memory, it's indistinguishable between whether the page is swapped out and never allocated. And this is a problem in our case. There are ways to improve it. Firstly, we currently patch the Linux kernel and improve the page map implementation to query the swap cache this comes with some marginal performance degradation, but it's not a problem at all. And the second approach is to use the LSEQ um, and skip never allocated pages with the seek data or seek hole. And another M in core system call, which is useful. We've been considering it well. Obviously, let's say we have the uh, we have the guests that has some uh, memory swapped out to the host swap. Whenever we do the live migration, we probably don't want to transfer, we don't want to page in the pages. If we had shared, um, if we had shared host swap file, we could simply attach it to the destination and then avoid transferring the pages altogether. We could only transfer the metadata. Uh, however, the interface around the host swap is somewhat limited and my colleagues at Nutanix are currently working on the feature and hopefully we'll see their work in the next KVM forum. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to show you the last slide, uh, lessons learned. Uh, important lesson is that um, swapping and the ballooning alone don't work. They have issues with the performance and the hybrid, the hybrid approach is the way to go for us. We also considered plenty of metrics and uh, deduced need and greed. We implemented the custom algorithm. 
on top of that. We learned a very important bit that shared memory isn't private memory. It's, it differs. It substantially differs. And more you dive in the sources, more you realize that. Uh, there are also corner cases around implementation of the certain user space uh, tools, kernel space, well, user space tools. There are ways to improve Kimu and uh, there are also ways to improve the swap subsystem, memory subsystem in the kernel. Nevertheless, the Linux ecosystem around the virtualization is decent and it provides the solid foundation for memory commit. What's needed is just uh, to tie all these pieces together with some sort of control plane. And uh, that's essentially allows you to build the memory commit in Linux. And this is how we did it for our customers and now it works and we build enterprise guide product. Linux is cool and uh, thanks for watching. Hope you also learned uh, lessons with us and stay safe, stay tuned. Goodbye.